everybody and welcome to our latest webinar. Scott and I will be talking today about office chairs and hybrid working. Can I just do a little bit of housekeeping before we start? Just to say um, that we're happy to take questions at the end of the session and there is a Q&A box, which I'm sure you can all find. Um, please, if you wish to ask a question, can you pop it in there? Um, you're also able to vote for questions that other people have put. So if you think they're important and want to save yourself typing, please, um, please just do that. There are a couple of polls um, that are running in the background. Um, please take part if you'd like to. Um, it's always interesting to see what, what you guys have to say. So really, without uh, much further ado, um, I want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. So I'm going to be setting the scene um, a little bit as to why seating is important and, and why you know certain functions of chairs are important. And then I'm going to hand on for the main session to Scott, who's going to join us. So Scott has joined uh, Posturite in 2010. He was a DSC assessor to begin with, and he had um, just finished graduating at the university um, in Dundee. He's now an account manager for our Scotland Territory, and he's the head of our nationwide agile working focus group. He's also a seating specialist and certainly somebody that I lean on when I have any specific questions about chairs. His responsibilities include advising clients on the most suitable chair solutions for their particular requirements and managing seating projects from start to finish. And he works very closely with our projects team. So he brings a lot of experience into our, the office wellbeing and hybrid and agile working relationships that we have to ensure that all our projects run smoothly as possible. So that would be Scott, but I'm just going to say a few words to start us off with, just really to set the scene. So why do we bother with chairs in the first place? Well, seating is really important because if we get a person supported in a chair in a good position, then that will free up the body and the brain to work effectively without being distracted by discomfort and pain. Now, it's not all about chairs. It's important for our movement and it's important to take breaks. But for what we're focusing on today is the importance of seating. I think it's just really impossible, really, really important to, to, to discuss this. So what is a good supported position? Well, in a good supported position, uh, the body is supported with the spine in a good position and the pelvis supported. It is the chair that does the work to take the pressure off the body. So this enables to have a good position so the joints and the tissues can work efficiently and effectively without creating pressure points or strain. Now, if we don't achieve a poor position, the opposite happens. And if we look a little bit like in this picture, where the chair is not supporting the body in the way we want. So we find that the spine comes out of position and so other tissues start to work really hard to try and maintain a good working base for the body. And this will also start to create fatigue. So that's the fundamental. We want a chair and the setup to support the body in a good position so it doesn't have to work so hard and things work effectively. Just want to go through a few slides just to show a few fundamentals if we get things wrong, if the chair does not fit or we don't get it adjusted properly. So well, let's say we don't adjust the height properly. So if the sitting height is wrong, if the person sits too low, so their hips are lower than their knees, we can see it encourages a sort of C-shaped position of the spine. This is going to be putting all sorts of pressures on the spine that aren't good for them. The pelvis will also be in a poor position because the hips are lower than the knees and so it'll rotate back. And this then also puts pressure on the arm position. If we sit too high, the opposite occurs. Not only do we not get good foot support, but actually the person will often lean forwards to gain the access to the keyboard, reducing the support for the spine and creating tension around the shoulder. If we get the seat depth wrong on our chairs, like in here, let's say, the seat is too short for the person's leg. They don't get good thigh support and you often land up with a pressure point halfway along the thigh, which is uncomfortable. If the seat is too long for the individual, then either you can get pressure behind the knee 
Or actually what people tend to do because it's uncomfortable is that they sit forwards away from the backrest. And as you can see, we lose the back support. If the backrest is incorrectly adjusted in height, so let's say the maximum curve of the backrest, instead of fitting in the curve, hits sort of the, the lower part of the thoracic region. As you can see, that tends to push somebody forwards. So creating tension around the shoulder, and also they tend to perch forwards. If it's too low, so the curve is too low for where we want it, again, the person tends to have a fairly C-shaped position. So the spine comes out of its natural working position and all sorts of pressures occur. If we get the backrest tilt incorrect, well, obviously, if it is too far forwards, there can be no support for the spine. So all the weight of the body goes down through the person. If, however, we have it too far back, yes, the back may be well supported if you're able to keep the curve in the spine, but look what it does to the neck, puts it into a really poor position. And this can land up with some nasty neck tension. And also you can see the arms tend to come forwards. So, I mean, it seems fairly obvious, and but it's so, so important to make sure the body can get that supported position in the right position. So now I'm going to pass on to Scott, who's going to explain how we can actually get those that position right. So, Scotty, over to Hello. you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful, great. So yeah, to layer onto what Catherine has said, it's worth looking at what a chair can offer. So what functions and features are on chairs to help facilitate that beneficial sitting position? This is also a, a, a good way to work through exactly how chairs could potentially differentiate themselves from each other um, to assist in the seating selection process. I, I think first of all, particularly for us at Posture, it's really important to remember that a chair is only really ergonomic, sorry, a, a, an ergonomic chair means really that it's only suitable for the user. Um, so it, we found recently that, that ergonomic is kind of becoming a, a hold all term in marketing um, with an undefined criteria for what specific features that ergonomic chair has. Different shapes and sizes of individuals means that even a chair with ergonomic functionality can be ergonomic if, for example, as we're about to explore, the back height is too big and the contours don't specifically match to the individual's um, curvature when in the S-curve position. Um, so can chairs with ergonomic features be used ergonomically as well? Um, I think we've just seen from the previous slides that with a backrest tilt, an independent back, back angle adjustment is, um, is a fantastic ad adjustment to have. But if we're too reclined, is that gonna potentially create um, bigger problems later down the line from an ergonomic perspective if, if used incorrectly? Um, so we, we've touched on pad dimensions there. Uh, we have the option of, of varying different sizes, both in terms of the backrest and the seat pad. That is typically measured in the form of height and width on the backrest or depth and width on the seat pad. Um, core adjustments that we typically look for. Now, the way I look at core adjustments is it help, it's the uh, adjustments the, that allow us to uh, adapt the chair to an individual's specific measurements. So typically we would look for a chair with a seat height seat depth adjustment, a back height adjustment, and a back angle adjustment. Then we move on to, to peripheral adjust, adjustments, which typically come in the form of a movement mechanism. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, movement mechanisms, traditionally, you would find chairs would move in four specific ways. You either had static, which means it didn't move at all. You had a chair in which the back angle was able to be adjusted independently from the seat pad. You have one which is now called the synchro mechanism, which as the backrest moves back, the seat pad adjusts at the same time using one lever or one adjustment. And then you have uh, what we call uh, balanced knee tilt mechanisms, or th there's a number of different names for these, but essentially as the, the, you set the back angle first, and then the chair um, a move, moves along that movement arc um, in relation to what the body needs. Um, typically, their tension to the individual center of gravity as well. Now, there are some new 
players to the game um, in terms of the way that movement can, can work. There's try movement or side to side movement or some call them full freedom movement, which is where you've got uh, a side to side um, motion or, or lateral movement um, that again can, can support when, when doing actions at either side of the workstation. Um, and then finally, we've got support additions. This could be in the form of inflatable air cells. Most commonly, they'll be found in the lumber, but you can also get them on the seat pad um, to compensate for, for a lack of stability or support um, in the sitting position. You can get those in the thoracic region of the spine or between the shoulder blades, which is um, uh, uh, available on a, on a large number of chairs. You've got different types of foam density. Um, and, uh, sorry, I should say densities or types. So that's where the likes of memory foam or comfort foam come into play. We can get cutouts on seat pads or, or in backrests themselves for that matter. Um, typically you'll see uh, coccyx cutouts, which remove the section of foam that the um, individual's tailbone is in, in touch with. Um, you've got some seat splits or split seat backrests um, where we can adapt the chair on, on various sides, depending on what the individual needs. And then of course, we've got neck rests and arm rests as well. Now these all come in various different degrees of functionality. Not all neck rests and arm rests are uh, created equal, but uh, there are a number of different options, um, both in terms of how they adjust and also where they're situated on the chair. Um, so in some, they are bolted to the underside of the seat pad, which means that even if the chair seat slide moves forward, the arm rests come forward as well which could potentially influence how we look at positioning individuals at the workstation. You have others which are typically found on the more premium chairs where the armrests are connected to the, the frame of the chair itself, which means they always stay in a static position rather than coming forward with the seat slide. Okay, thanks Tom. So as we look into um, shifting to think about uh, task seating in hybrid spaces, um, as we now know them, Hybrid's not new. Um, before uh, the, the, the most recent uh, movements, we had flexible working, agile working, adjusted working. They're all terms that we used. Um, some of you may have been at our profile days back in 2016, 17, um, where we, uh, we did a agile working roadshow and talked about some of the, the, the varying uh, things to consider when, when adapting the organizational culture to, to an agile work. Uh, sorry, one, one in which we were working agilely. Um, so I've set the pictures up here to show what hybrid working was like prior to, to, to COVID. And really we found it was primarily a hot desking exercise. It was how do we, um, how do we take the personal ownership away from workstations and how do we have a, a, a greater flow of traffic if we only ever have a, an 80% um, occupancy rate within our building? Can we make sure that we always utilize the space um, as, appropriate as appropriately as possible. Then COVID happened and the vast majority went home, which left us with some empty offices. During that time, the home very much became the primary workstation, which has created a very interesting approach over the past couple of years as to looking at our physical office space and saying, is this do we do we want to go back to the way that it was or is there an opportunity to maybe adapt this workspace so that it better meets the organizational needs if the home is the primary workstation where an individual sits down and performs dse tasks um, or, or data inputs or whatever it may be what does the office space then need to be is it simply a mirroring of those same actions there is uh, does that create an environment that um best um, fulfills what the organization is trying to do? Or does the office space maybe need to change um, in, in what we use it for uh, to support collaborative work or, or maybe the tasks that can't be done um, by an individual by themselves within the home space? Um, okay, great. So uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. So this is how we've defined the hybrid spaces. Again, we could probably flesh these out. Most of you guys will have most, if not all of these to some degree um, available within, within your, your, uh, your environments. So we've got eight hour single user, eight hour, eight hour multi-user or what we call hot desking, touchdown multi-user hot desking spaces, which is used for typically shorter bursts of time, 
homeworking and meeting remote or collaboration spaces. And again, collaboration space is probably the, the one that can really be fleshed out to, to multiple different options. Um, there's a, a number of different ways organizations are doing this now. Thanks, Tom. So with different types of workspaces, it's worth exploring how these areas um, are used um, and how that could impact and influence the task seating choices that we have. Um, it's an opportunity to maximize the effects of a well-adjusted chair um, that is suited to the areas um, that they're going into that ask different things of the seating now. So, um, so how can we make sure that each of these areas function successfully? Um, the chair is an important part of that. So let's have a little bit of a look into, into those spaces in particular, what they ask of our seating and how we can make sure that the adjustments are tailored appropriately for that space. Okay, thanks Tom. So first of all, we'll look at eight hour single user. Um, this is the most common one historically that we've, we've had to deal with before the dawn of, of hybrid working uh, in its form. So it's usually one user, one chair. They uh, typically have a, a strong sense of ownership of that chair. They'll set it once, either themselves um, or maybe an, an expert comes out and sets them up um, to, to make sure that the chair fully supports them in the way that they need. Um, with that ownership and care, you typically find that the lifespan of that chair is increased. One, you don't have, you don't really have a, day to, a daily operation of those core adjustments. Typically, individuals will set them and that will be their chair. No one will come along and adjust it. It will be as is. Um, what they will need to do is adjust the peripheral adjustments on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that might be put the chair into a free flow movement mechanism, for example. Um, that free flow is likely to be um, to, to not be adjusted um, beyond that other than simply locking and unlocking. Or they might have an inflatable air cell in the backrest and they might want to inflate that throughout the day. Okay, thanks Tom. So a chair that's potentially optimal for that space is, is one with traditional levers. And by traditional levers, what I mean is each lever does a single action, and that allows the individual to tailor it specifically for their requirements. Um, ideally, we have infinite number of lock points on the back angle adjustment, so that once the pelvis is in the correct position, influenced mainly by the height of the chair, we can set the back angle exactly to where it needs to be. Um, so we can personalize those settings, we can tension the movement mechanism specifically for that individual's requirements so that when the chair is in motion, it's not, it's not uh, making them feel like they're getting pushed forward and it, it's not making them feel like they're reclining away from them. It's fine tuned for their requirements. And as a result, we can, let's just say we are choosing a chair that offers these traditional adjustments and we're giving them to circa hundred staff um, we need to make sure that that chair is in some way adjustable, i.e. we've got a choice of seat pads, we've got a cho choice of backrests, um, and even seat pad options as well to make sure that their specific needs are, are being met from a, a dimensional perspective, but also in terms of the functional point of view. What we'll find there is there will hopefully be less ongoing curative costs. Um, and by curative, I mean reactive chair requirements because each individual has a chair already as part of the standard offering um, that can be tailored to meet their, their needs. So the less ongoing curative cost. Um, so I've, I've put some suggestions on here. Again, there will be a number that can do, a number of different options that can do this. Um, I'm sitting on an RH logic myself. So I've put that as my suggestion. That's the one that I feel um, uh, allows me to support myself fully um, with all the, the uh, optimal chair features that I've mentioned there. Um, there are a number of different options that can do this on the market. As such, I've put the, the positive piece, it, which is a, an entry level economically priced um, option that is, that is available um, that offers similar core adjustments the key differentiator is how the movement mechanism functions and also the contour of the pad design. Okay, thanks Tom. Okay, so multi-user space. Um, multiple users, one chair. Um, these adjustments will typically need to be set daily in order to match the differing requirements of each user. So the levers will take much more of a beating <laughs> than they would do if it was a single user, single chair. Um, 
those peripheral adjustments will need to be adjusted daily as well. Um, so that will be things like um, putting the chair in motion. If you have inflatable lumbers or, or inflatable air cells in the seat pad, they will typically have a, a daily operation as well. Um, now we can't say the for, this for everyone, but um, typically you'll, you'll find that there's a less ownership. That's not an individual's chair. So there is a chance that the, um, the, the care given to that chair is, is less than it would be if it was, if it was uh, individually owned. And as a, as a result of that, we're potentially looking at a reduced lifespan of that chair. There are ways to counteract that, but, um, but that is typically what we find. Um, also, there's, there's less chance of an individual really drilling down into the setup of it um, if they're only going to be using for it for a day at a time. So things that um, staff members may be unaware are on the chair, like a, a tension control on the movement mechanism, are likely to go unadjusted from the vast majority. Um, okay, thanks, Tom. So the optimal chair, uh, possibly a plug and play option, um, one with fewer adjustments, um, but enough adjustments to be able to allow the individuals to adopt a, a beneficial posture at the workstation. Um, there is a, a, a new trend in auto tension movement or, or body weight tension controlled um, movement mechanisms. And the way that they work is the chair responds to the level of weight that is put on it and adjusts the tension of the movements accordingly, depending on, on the force exerted on it. Um, so that is a, a very good option um, to, to kind of counteract the self-tension requirements of, of, an, of, a, of a single user chair. Uh, also, we look at 50th centile um, pad size and type. We try to find the, uh, the, the center point, the most common measurements within an organization, and then put forward a chair that is appropriate for the vast majority of people. Um, what a, a number of organizations like to do is have a, a couple of varying back sizes as well, if they feel that that's going to, um, not having uh, that, that option is going to be uh, an issue for, for those using it. Um, but there is going to be likely be a, a greater need for an individual with specific musculoskeletal concerns to, to have reactive options available as well. So there is likely to be a, a greater need for curative expenditure later down the line if we don't have an option that is, um, is, is most suited to that space. So my suggestions for these, and, and these are up with some of my favorite chairs available, um, are the Hag Sophie. Um, which is available in upholstered or mesh. Um, it works on uh, what we call an imbalance movement mechanism, which uh, very much lends itself to height adjustable desking um, because we've got multiple different seating positions that we can adopt. It's no longer just standard seat seating or, or standing. You've also got a, a varying degree in between that as well to keep the body guessing throughout use. Um, Another potentially more cost uh, economically priced option is the, the Boss Toro, which again operates on that uh, auto tension movement. Okay, thanks Tom. Touchdown, multi-user spaces. Okay, so again, it's essentially hot desking. However, it's for shorter periods of time. So we are trying to um, find a way to support the individual as best possible when they're likely not going to spend a huge degree of time setting themselves up. So the more intuitive the chair is, the better experience the end user will have. Um, so likely little adjustment um, used for very short periods of time, possibly not even a DSE task area. It might be a place where people go um, write some notes. It might be a reading space. Um, so all these things are worth considering when, um, when, when exploring the chairs. But typically we are looking at a reduced lifespan of the chair purely because of the number of users using that space. Um, thanks, Tom. So plug and play is key here. Um, minimal adjustments really, because the more adjustments there are, there are the more things that can go wrong and also the increased amount of wear that there is, um, which will only impact individuals who will be experiencing that chair later on in the chair's lifespan. Um, uh, I, I've put um, I put auto tension movement mechanism there because because I think that's key. Um, smaller pads um, it, it, again. It's I get I appreciate this chair doesn't really, the chair in the image doesn't really showcase smaller pads, um, but it, it, it is worth considering um, 
how do we do we want to differentiate the chair? Do we want to make it? Um, do we want to make it so that the um, the chairs look similar to the rest of the office? Um, but we what we don't want is we don't want people mistaking the A tower hot desking space with the touchdown hot down uh, with touchdown uh, hot desking space. So by changing the chairs up, we can very much say, look, we only expect you to work here for a couple of periods of time. So obviously, there's, there's ways to support that with signage around the space, um, but. Uh, perhaps having a chair that, that looks different, maybe provides support to the, the mid to lower back, which is, is key, um, but isn't the full high back version that you may want for your hot desking space. Um, so my su suggestions there, uh, Hayworth Nia is, is a, a very interesting option. It's, it's largely automated and it, the backrest works on almost like a hand wave type mechanism. So it's a, it's a side to side, um, which stimulates blood flow um, and can support in, in lateral positions, um, but it doesn't require any tension. Um, another good option for this is potentially the, the hard capital pulse, which is a saddle seat, um, but it's it's been very successful in these kind of spa spaces because of the variation in position you can adopt. You essentially have five different working positions with the capiscal, standard seating, reverse, side saddle on both sides, or a perch. Wonderful, thanks Tom. Okay, so meeting room and collaboration space. I, again, multi-users, one chair, little adjustment typically used in these spaces. <clears throat> um, I've put used for short periods of time, typically, likely not a DSE task area. Um, it's much more about facilitating conversations in these spaces. Um, I appreciate it. it probably looks like I've contradicted myself a little bit in terms of saying short periods of time and long periods of time, but they're really in these collaboration spaces, especially at the moment, there is potentially a need for uh, long-term use. Um, an awful lot of organizations are encouraging staff to come into the office purely for collaboration. If it's a DSE task day, or the, the majority of the tasks that they're doing throughout that day are gonna be DSE options, then um, they, they may come into the office purely for collaborative work. So they might be bouncing around a couple of different spaces. Um, so although typically there'll be short periods of time, um, an hour or less for a meeting, we can't rule out the possibility of that space being used for half a day while, while colleagues do brainstorming exercises or bounce ideas off each other or, or flesh out a problem uh, that they're experiencing. So it's appropriate to, to make sure that the, the chair that is put in that place reflects how long um, the, the, the users are likely to be there. Um, so we, maybe we look at uh, chairs with, with different pad design, for example. Maybe meeting room chairs aren't necessarily just going to be your cantilever and, and PU foam. Uh, you might have some areas where padding is required. You might have some areas where you don't want a large degree of padding because you're trying to create quick turnover. I know there's been a lot of work with, within a number of organizations to reducing meeting lengths um, down from the, the typical hour that would go in out, the Outlook diary down to 20 minutes. Um, a quick, what do we need to do, and, and then move on. So maybe the, the less cushioned or padded the chair might encourage that throughput. Um, okay, thanks, Tom. So yeah, I've said think padding, uh, seat height that matches the desk. I think this is often key in meeting spaces. There's nothing worse than sitting too low for an hour and you feel the, the tension uh, coming up on your, your forearms from the, the desk uh, pushing in on your, on your forearm. Um, autonomous movement. I, I, I'm, I'm a keen advocate of meeting room chairs having some degree of movement. Um, adjustability is typically not um, required as much, but, but a degree of tilt very much is. Um, the stimulation of blood flow is not only going to help from a musculoskeletal standpoint, but from a, from a uh, memory retention um, uh, product productivity perspective, um, that movement is going to be key. Uh, freedom of uh, use of the upper body, less adjustments typically you, means a more improved sustainability story. Um, so if sustainability is key, the less adjustments on there, um, kind of the better in those spaces. Um, so yeah, um, my suggestions for this, um, HAG have just released the Tion, um, which has a very large degree of uh, post-consumer plastic um, recycled content that it's made out of. Um, so again, a, a great sustainability story. That's the image that you see there. Um, 
also I've put the boss boss Ola. Uh, it's a more padded option, um, a little bit more like a, an egg shape. Um, still provides a very comfortable option for meeting space. Okay, thanks, Tom. And homeworking, finally. So one user, one chair, very much like the single user DSE spaces. The key differentiators here are the domestic fire regs. Um, there is a different requirement for uh, fabric and foam in those spaces. Um, they need to meet the, the domestic um, requirements. So something worth considering. Um, there is also likely an aesthetic preference because it's going into individuals' homes. Um, also, we, we need to then have a think about what happens if that user leaves and they have uh, a chair that is uh, an asset of the organization. Do we want to um, encourage them an end of life um, uh, process for, for um, scrapping the chair or for um, ethically disposing, I should say? Or do we want to find some way to get that asset back into the building? Um, also, how does the user purchase? I think this is key. Um, it's it, typically with homeworking, we're not looking at the same bulk orders that you would get shipped to an office and, and rolled out on one installation. Um, there are a number of different ways organizations want to promote um, facilitating uh, homeworking use. Um, so are we asking the individuals to buy it and then claim back? Are we asking, are we allowing the organization to, to buy on a one-to-one -one basis and, and ship out to the client? All that will determine what the most appropriate chair is, um, because depending on how you do it, you may very well need a chair that is stock and available on a three to five day lead time, for example. Um, so selecting an option that is pre-made um, to a pre-domestic specification uh, will, will save an awful lot of time along that, along that journey and also put less onus on the individual um, to, to explore um, options which are best for them. So timeframes are key as well. Thanks, Tom. So yeah, domestic fabric and foam, traditional levers so they can set them up exactly how they need, um, tweakable adjustments, less ongoing curative costs. If an individual set up uh, with the, the correct chair at home, then obviously the less likely they are to, to develop musculoskeletal uh, problems moving forward that not only will influence them at that home workstation, but also when they come back to the office as well. So worth exploring um, in-stock models um, in terms of uh, lead times. So yeah, suggestions there, Homeworker and Homeworker Plus from Posturite, uh, I've put those on there simply because we stock large amounts of them because of the need. Um, they are already domestically certified and they come with all the correct labeling. They provide uh, individual uh, traditional core adjustments and a movement mechanism on there as well. So uh, yeah, they would be my suggestions. Thanks, Tom. So worth looking at um, how manufacturers have uh, adapted to this changing market. Um, there may even be a few manufacturers on the call, so nice to see everyone. <laughs> the, so yeah, fewer products have been released. Um, an awful lot of the portfolios have been repurposed um, in line with domestic use. Um, so that might not be a complete refresh of the chair or the marketing around it, but they will be using domestically certified fabric and foam. Um, and they will uh, be showcasing those within domestic spaces a lot more rather than just in office eight hour spaces. Um, sustainability is key at the moment. Uh, you'll have noticed by uh, putting forward the likes of the, um, the, uh, the Hagtion and, and the Ola that the sustainability options that are being put forward to the market tell slightly different stories than they would have done five to 10 years ago. Um, it's less and less about the, um, the uh, able, ability to recycle the chair at the end of life, although that is important. Um, it's actually much more about the uh, uh, post-consumer plastics that are used in the recycling process itself. Um, or recycled content that's used um, to, to make that chair. Um, and there's some really interesting options, really interesting stories that are told as, as a result of those. Um, it's, I know it's, it's paramount to an, an awful lot of the chair manufacturers in the market now. Um, so yes, if, if you guys are needing more information on that, please let me know. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, price increases across the board. Um, the, the, not, not only, uh, the furniture industry, but the entire uh, economy is, is uh, impacted by uh, ballooning costs um, from manufacturing, from logistics, 
from uh, variance in supply and because the markets needed different things since, um, since March 2020. So with that has come increased costs. So chairs now cost more than they did at the beginning of the year um, and are likely to cost more in 2023 um, because of, of the external influences to that. Um, okay, thanks, Tom. So parting thoughts, um, just something to leave you guys with. I think that the same messaging always comes with our, our hybrid discussions. Hybrid working can offer a greater variance in working environments um, that are appropriate for the tasks that are carried out in that space. It's worth exploring the options that are used within there. Um, okay, thanks. So match the task at hand with the most appropriate space and equipment. Thanks, Tom. By selecting a chair with features and functions that serve each space optimally, benefits to health, productivity, usability, sustainability, and budget can be achieved. Thanks, Tom. And I, I think this is key. Employees need a reason to go to the office, um, especially if their primary workstation is at home. The organizations have a, a real opportunity to review how the uh, physical space is used. And does it now best serve the needs? Are, they, are the individuals coming in just to do more single user DSE tasks? Or are they coming in and, and executing the tasks they can't do by themselves, like collaborative work, uh, like walk around spaces, like, um, uh, like uh, absorption of culture uh, and influence from colleagues? Um, I think a lot of that potentially makes us rethink the way that the offices are laid out. Wonderful, thanks Tom. Ooh. Any other questions? Oh, Scotty, we've got a few few lovely questions coming up. So, so that's great. Um, I do, there's been quite a lot on people wanting some more knowledge on the models you've talked about. And so I think we can reassure people that we'll do a bit of work on that and make sure that either in the email following that or on the presentation that we put on the website, we'll, we'll put some more information about the models you've talked about. Um, we'll be able to do something along those lines, won't we? Absolutely, yes. And again, you can see my email address there. So if there's any specific questions to do with a chair, how it works, um, I'll, if, you, if you pop me a little email, I'll, uh, I'll certainly pop that over to you. Fantastic. So first of all, well, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, I can get this, is do you think memory foam is needed on single user reactive chairs? Um, it's requested an awful lot. Um, from a personal perspective, no. Um, I think, to be honest, I, I think that it actually serves a little bit better being on a backrest than it would do on a seat pad. My concern with, um, with memory foam is you typically find that it bottoms out. So whereas individuals typically uh, want it for a, a softer seating experience, but by the time that the weight is applied, you actually get a compression of the foam and, and you get the adverse effect. Um, another thing about memory foam, if anyone's got a memory foam bed in the summertime, they'll know exactly what I mean. It's very hot. So um, you can get um, quite uncomfortable um, as a result of it being on there. Uh, there are a number of advancements to foam that are used on chairs. Um, and just like with, with memory foam beds, you've actually got support layers and what they call comfort layers now on top. Those are more effective, in my opinion, than traditional memory foam. Um, does that answer? Yes, I think it does. I think cool. it does. Um, it probably feeds in a little bit to, to the question about, um, we've got, how often should an eight hour chair be changed for a new one? I have one that's 15 years old and the seat is becoming ward and hard. Should I ask for a replacement? What advice? I, I think my advice would be is, does the chair function in the way that it's supposed to? And does it deliver the degree of support that the user expects it to? If the answer to either one of those questions is no, then it might be worth considering having that conversation with line management or with the appropriate people internally to provide you with an option that does. It's really difficult to say in general what the life expectancy of a chair is. Um, the, the closest we can come is that manufacturers apply a manufacturer's warranty rating. Um, and that is a, a specific length of time of which the manufacturer has confidence that the chair will last that period of time. Um, that doesn't mean that it won't exceed that, but it does mean that, uh, that any 
uh, breakages or any manufactured manufacturing defects that fall out with that window won't be covered by uh, the manufacturer's warranty. So you can typically get a pretty good gauge as to how long it's going to last. That being said, you'll find some chairs are uh, a five-year warranty that can last, that, that, that serve their function for longer than that. You'll get some that are a five-year warranty that, that don't quite measure up to that. Um, but again, uh, that's probably the closest we can come to an accurate time frame. I think it's, I mean, I've got chairs that are quite old, um, but the great thing about this sort of the re new refresh is the fact that a lot of them we can change the upholstery on, isn't it? Because a good chair, generally, it's the upholstery that goes. And as we're looking more at sustainability now, it's about replacement pads, isn't it, rather than throwing away the whole chair. So I think it, it, it's worth asking the questions because the mechanisms on them often last a, a goodly long time, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. OK, so um, we've got a question about the fact that nearly all the um, images you showed had arms on them. Um, and the, the question is, though, do these prevent the user getting the seat right under the workstation? Uh, controversial. No, again, not all armrests are created equal. Um, in, in, resp in response to the, um, the images, that we, uh, the, we use manufacturers stock images typically, and, and they want to show as many options as possible within a lot of those images. So uh, they typically put armrests on there. I, I, a couple of those images there, I, I would agree that armrests aren't um, the best option. Um, uh, where am I going? Um, from, I, I always take armrests off my chair. Um, that's just me. I prefer to have the freedom to get in and out from either side and to be able to have my, my arms move freely and not impact it. In terms of relation to the height, it all depends. Uh, the where the armrests are situated, are they attached to the frame coming from the back of the chair, or are they coming? Are they attached to the seat pad and come from the center of the seat pad? Um, that will determine how far forward those armrests go. Uh, I like to draw a line between the front of, in, in the setting that they're in, I like to draw a line between the front point of my armrests if there's a gap between that front point and your, your stomach, in my opinion, those armrests are too far forward. And I'll encourage you to sit further back from the edge of your workstation, which will, again, encourage you to round your shoulders when coming forward to use the keyboard. Um, however, if an armrest is, um, if you, sorry, if your stomach is not further forward than that, that front line, um, and the armrests are nicely nestled back the way, um, I don't see any problem. In them being there at all. There's no requirement to have armrests, um, but a, a, a number of individuals like them in order to feel supported on their shoulder when, when in a comfortable position. I love an armrest, but you're absolutely right. It's got to be more of an elmo rest than, yeah. than an armrest. You know, I think it, it does reduce the tension on, on the upper limbs, but it's got to fit right. If it doesn't fit right, yeah, we land up in problems. So, yeah. yeah. We've had quite a lot of chat about mesh chairs okay. and I'll I'll just um I'll come in I have to say I, I I'm fairly cynical about mesh chairs I've seen a lot of mesh chairs uh, make lots of things and I often find that that they, they may be quite good to begin with and they I've seen most of them get a bit baggy although I think there are quite a lot of chairs now with that are mesh but provide back support in other ways as well so having had my say uh, Scott what, what what's your viewpoint on mesh chairs uh, again and I, I I use the same tagline quite a lot. I, I don't think all mesh chairs are created equal. Um, there are different ways that mesh back chairs are, are uh, manufactured. Um, you've got different ways in which the mesh, uh, I'll use mesh as an overall term just now and come back to that, are connected to the frame themselves. The, um, the, the more economic options on the market are pot potentially not as robust as, as the ones that are tailor-made specifically for mesh back chairs. Um, and also there, there's different grades to, to which the, the mesh, there's a, there's a number of mesh options that actually aren't uh, mesh at all. They're, they're a fabric, some are plastic, some are rubber. Um, so depending on what kind of mesh you go for will depend on the give that it has and how likely that um, material is to stand the test of time. So do you, um... Do you think, well, what are the benefits of mesh? The key, well, to be honest, mesh has got to where it is because of the aesthetics. Um, I think that's that's key. Um, they, they fit a 
a more kind of modern looking office in many people's opinion. Uh, it's, it's breathability. Um, it's, you get more air circulation so that they're a little bit less hot. Um, they're the real benefits. Um, I think with most uh, chairs that are used reactively for individuals with musculoskeletal problems, you will find upholstered still reigns supreme. Um, but that doesn't mean that a mesh that is uh, a mesh chair that is appropriately manufactured for the space that it's going into. That's the most I can. That's the that's the most uh, yeah uh, politically savvy I can be. Is um, yeah, it's still going to be. It could still present potentially deliver the same level or a, a comparable level of support to that of the upholstered. Okay, okay. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in, Scott. So I think we're going to have to be quite, uh, quite um, precise. Okay. Um, so I've got a question. We've been getting more people who required specific chairs for medical reasons to support their optimal position. I am unclear on how we should adapt this with hybrid working hot desking. So having just said we need to be short, we've actually got quite an interesting question that perhaps is a, a bit more in depth on that one. Would you like to take that one? Uh, I, I think you you might potentially be the best person to say okay because okay. a, 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 a lot of this comes down to an individual and how it adapts to them I, I would say yes I think for me the more adjustability you have in your um, multi-user chairs the less um, specific chairs you need for individuals because if you can adjust it to people's um, you know um, thigh length and and back height and that sort of thing you know you, they're not going to need individual chairs obviously the people who are not symmetrical who are who've got different body shapes from the traditional symmetrical body shape will need something different but from my viewpoint if you invest in slightly better seating for your hot desking environments you will need less um specific chairs do you think i've explained that appropriately scott um yeah. But I think that the worse your standard chairs are, the more specific chairs you're going to need. Um, so, I, so I hope I hope that helps. Um, we do have clients that have provided specific chairs for people, and they have like chair nurseries, um, which I think are quite difficult because they create quite a lot of space issues and, and that type of thing. So, my encouragement is to get a good basic chair because that will cut down on the number of specific chairs you need. There'll always be some though. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll sort of move on from, from that one a little bit. Um, oh, gosh. Do we have a suggestion of what would be suitable for an acoustic pod? In terms of... So most acoustic pods would be for touchdown work, I'd imagine. They're not going to be a whole day. That that's well, certainly when we've looked at acoustic pods, most of them are for short meetings um, and for you know um, it's one to ones things like that. I mean, I think the the environment isn't particularly good for anything longer than that. Yeah, uh, and I'm guessing this is an acoustic pod without soft seating pre-installed, um, so it's a task user or a task seating area. So I think the same principles apply to the previous slide. So you'd look for a chair that is um, welcoming, um, but has some degree of uh, autonomous movement uh, built into it. So that because it's short term use, we don't have an individual who has to try too hard in, the, in adjusting it to have it um, provide a, a comfortable seating position. Um, so uh, seat height, seat slide, very very possibly um and a, a body weight tension movement mechanism would be would be appropriate okay okay now i think we'll just take a, a moment away from the questions actually and we'll look at the polls that people have um popped in mm -hmm. um scotty i presume you've got um access to the 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 um output of the polls if not uh, i shall read it to you i i where would i find that sorry I'm... Oh, oh well there you go i'm ahead of you so we we, we talked about um actually you know, whether um, we asked people whether their organization had made any physical changes to their office to support hybrid working. And, you know, the answers are, are, are quite, I think, quite reassuring because 75% said that people had made a change, which I thought oh, was right. excellent. 14% mm. have said no, and 10% were unsure. So I think that's definitely moving in the right direction that the, the employers are, are really embracing this and trying to get the, the things right. However, 
When we asked about whether it was whether their office is optimally furnished for hybrid working, only 58% said yes. So okay. obviously of that, um, that, that um, work that people have done, obviously some of it hasn't hit the mark. So what was envisaged for hybrid working maybe hasn't worked out as to what, what has been working for that, for that individual. Mm. Now, this is an interesting one. We asked people how many different chairs do they use on a regular basis now? So we gave people a choice of one, two, three, four, five or more. Now, one, 42 percent. I think that's probably realistic. Yep. Two, 37 percent. So maybe home and in a hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. Three chairs, 12 percent. That's probably going to be surprising to some people. Four chairs, 5 percent and five or more. 4%. Okay. So there's quite a lot of people who are obviously using lots of these different designed environments. And it looks to me as if people are beginning to get the right seating, perhaps, for the right sort of work. So I think that's quite encouraging. Absolutely. Um, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on, on those figures. Uh, no, I mean, not surprised. I, I think the... Um... <clears throat> It's going to be. I think a lot of that will probably come from from meeting room or collaboration space. Hopefully, because from from what I'm hearing, that's the area that if changes have been made to the office, that's the key key area. Um, the hot desking exercise had been done pre working from home. So, um, yeah, not not yeah. not particularly um, yeah surprised by that, but that's very positive. I think it's quite positive. I've got a, a question here, which probably feeds into the question we talked about curative chairs, where mm -hmm. um, we're being asked, is it a good idea to add an extra back support to a chair? I mean, this is this is very much a question for you. I'm sure that <laughs> I can tell you're itching to answer. Oh, well, I am itching to answer. I think generally, <laughs> if you've got a chair that fits you well, to add a, a, an additional back support will upset the balance, particularly if you've got a chair with a good balance rocking, because you'll actually bring the weight um, forwards and potentially the chair will not be working as well as, um, as it should. However, if you are using an occasional chair like your dining room chair um, and, you know, it's not providing enough support, then actually adding additional support can be beneficial. So if you've got a fairly high functioning chair, I would suggest it is not a good idea to put in a back support. But if you've got a fairly basic non-adjustable chair, then I think back supports can be a real value. Um, so I think I hope that sort of gives some indication. Um, I think sometimes occasionally if you've got a, a short term problem, like maybe you've got a, a pregnant employee or returning to work from um, you know, d discomfort in your, your back, occasionally an inflatable support can be of benefit. But um, I think that's about me on that. I have a, a yes, question here it. that I, I, I would like to answer this from a personal perspective, <laughs> if that's all right. So what are your thoughts on gaming style chairs? A number of our users are opting for these as an affordable option to use at home. Um, I, I think I have, an, I have a number of concerns with this, um, namely that my, uh, my nephew keeps calling me while he's sitting on his. Um, but uh, uh, just to rub it in my face, he's a Man United fan and, and I'm, I'm not. Um, so... Uh, I think that the main thing with the gaming style chairs is they're typically, we, we don't really know the source of them. Um, there are a number that don't have a set manufacturer attributed to them. So finding the uh, the safety standards that, that go alongside them are, are typically quite difficult. Um, we don't know the, the company that makes them and to what um, standard they're operating to, where they're located, all that kind of stuff. So it's very difficult to quality control them from a, an, as an employer perspective from a purely functional perspective uh they typically don't have back height adjustment um so the way that you, they, they kind of operate more like car seats so you've got the ability to if i do it like that you've got the ability to adjust the back angle but the seat themselves are typically static so you, the at the natural curvature which is usually quite pronounced on those chairs are um are unable to be moved to the correct point. So there's a chance that they could push on top of the glutes and push them further away or potentially support too high and not offer the degree of back support that we look for. Um, also, the armrests on them are typically huge and do potentially um, prohibit access to the workstation. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to lump a few together because we've, we've had a few questions about 
um, where people have been provided with chairs, particularly with specific needs. If they leave the company, should they take the chair with them? Should they come back? Um, I don't think it's a very straightforward question. Um, um, it does. There's a few tax implications, and obviously, there's a few um, ongoing making sure the maintenance is there questions and and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'd like to take a sort of fairly pragmatic approach. You know, if somebody has a significant uh, medical problem and a, and a complex chair has been provided for them, it would seem a little silly to. To, to, to provide that, you know, not allow them to take that further forwards, because the likelihood is it's not going to fit somebody else very well. Um, so I would think in that case, one probably should let them go through. I also think that going forward, so many of us will have our own home workstations that maybe we'll take the responsibility for. So maybe it'll be a question that, you know, when we come to work for somebody, people will say, well, home working is part of um, our requirement. Um, could you please confirm what standard your home workstation is this is what we require it to be so it may well be down to every single one of us who wish to work at home that maybe be providing our own in the future so I think it's a little bit of a watching brief um, but I think it's it's fair to say Scott and, and please tell me if I'm wrong the, the the difficulties of getting chairs in and out of people's homes and the costs of it um, can actually often make this quite difficult. So if one can find a, a simple approach to ensure that people have good seating at home um, and an acceptance of the fact that we have home working going to be going on, I think, for the rest of our, our lives, I would suggest a real pragmatic approach. I mean, do you, th do you think that's fair, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the logistic exercise of um, collecting chairs from individuals' homes, bringing them back to a central facility, essentially upcycling them so that they don't look like they have been in someone's house for a period of time, usually quite a long period of time, um, and then issuing them out to another colleague will, in more than most situations, be more expensive than simply buying a new chair. So providing dialogue and guidance as to ethical disposal measures for the individual who has it will typically not only cost the organisation less as a holistic approach, um, but also will add towards the sustainability credentials if going towards um, ISO accreditation. Yeah, I think we definitely want to stop disposal of chairs that are that are of, um, that are the serviceable, um, and um, we certainly want to reduce the amount of fuel and things um, that is taken to sort of you know bring them back as well, don't we? So, I think it, it comes down to what you were saying is when we have a when we design hybrid working, actually thinking about this thing in advance um, can help the planet as well as help everybody else too, can't it? Yeah, so, um, I'm sorry to have rolled several of those in together, but I, I hope that's helpful for for some of you. Um, just having a look. Have I missed any, Scott? Can you see any there that is? Um... Oh, so there's a little one at the bottom there. Can you detail the regs for chairs in the home versus the office? Um, I think that's really quite quite simple in in, in many ways. Um, the DSC regulations uh, talk about workstations. Um, it doesn't matter where the workstation is. So if the workstation is in prolonged use and would be covered by the DSC regs, it doesn't matter whether it's at home or in the office. So the same regulations apply. Um, obviously, if somebody is, is not working, is, is only work doing sort of 15 minutes emails now and again, or only doing Zoom calls, um, the requirements for the chair will be completely different from if they are inputting or you know, at their workstation you know, for several hours a day. So the actual regs really don't change according to the environment. Um, but they will obviously change according to the tasks that's done. So I, I hope I hope that helps. Oh, um, sorry, Catherine, sorry. just just on that. So the yep. the um, that's from a functional perspective and yes. from a, a build quality perspective. But from the fire regs, there is a slight variation um, in them in the fact that there isn't a domestic. There, there are only domestic furniture tests um, for uh, uh, flammability. Um, there isn't an there isn't a home use chair test, if that makes any sense. So there is a, a specific requirement for the foam and fabric that are used on office chairs that are to be used um, within domestic space. Um, it's typically CMHR foam that's required and uh, fabric that is um, uh, 
uh, what's the word, uh, adheres to a, uh, an, a, a, sorry, uh, an approved range of flammability. So um, there is a statement there from, from Postura if you wish to, to get access to that, um, but it's typically the manufacturer who um, sets those parameters. Yeah, but the statement's on our website, isn't it, if people want to, to have a look at that. So um, if anyone's yeah. there. Now, I am conscious it's now 12 o'clock. We, we have run out of time. So for those of you who haven't managed to get to your questions, or we'll, we'll try and come back to you individually um, if, we, if we don't think we've answered it. So I really want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our final webinar of um, 2022. We will be back in January and we'll be sending out the details for that um, as soon as we can. Now, if you haven't um, subscribed to our mailing list, may I suggest you do that and therefore we'll make sure you get information. And I've just been told that actually if you get, if you are a new subscriber, you get 20% off your next order. So it sounds to me like a good thing, a little, <laughs> little early Christmas present there. Um, so please, please go ahead and do that. And I look forward to seeing you all in January. So actually the sun has come out here, the rain has gone. So please um, enjoy and we'll see you in January. Thank you, Scott, for joining me today. Thanks, Catherine. Goodbye now. Bye now.